CK Prahalad lecture series. CK Prahalad lecture series is an interaction with industry leaders and intellectuals across the industry segments to share their experience of being lead businesses. The theme for today's talk is digital marketing as a catalyst. As of April 2020, there is 4.57 billion internet users across the globe. India has 687 million active internet users and over 400 million of them are active social media users. I don't think much to say about digital marketing, but we are here to listen to Ms. Deepali Nair. Before I start, I want to introduce about our guest of today, Ms. Deepali Nair, is a Chief Marketing Officer, IBM, India and South Asia. She is responsible for driving marketing and brand initiatives, strategy and customer relationship management and execution of, for IBM India and South Asia. One of the India's senior and accomplished marketers, Nair has worked extensively across marketing, e-commerce, brand, product, and sales. She held leadership positions with IIFL, sorry, IFFL, Investment Manager Group of Companies, Mahindra, LNP, Financial Services Group, and HFBC. She has also worked with brands such as Tata Motors, DPL Mobile, Graft, FC Bulka, and, and also was a marketing manager for Safola and Medica at Marico Industries. One of the ba back of the success of businesses she has led, she gets invited to speak at technology and digital forums across the industry and abroad, such as India Digital Summit, Actex, iMedia, CBIC, EMAI. She has been a jury member numerous times in ad clubs, MYs, FIs, ABBYs, and IAMAI Digital Awards and DMAI Awards. Nair is highly respected by peers and, and the industry and has received several prestigious awards. She volunteers her time with, as a mentor to startups lead by women entrepreneurs at Zone uh, Startup India. On behalf of Department of Management Studies, Dhananda Sarkar College of Engineering, I welcome Ms. Deepali Nair. I hand over the session to our student executors, Ms. Santana Reddy and Ms. Impana. Thank you, Hema. Over to Chandana. Yeah. yeah. Thank no, you. but I want to thank you first before Chandana takes over. Thank you for yeah. giving such a long introduction. <laughs> yeah, nice to listen about your story by reading, you know, how was such a wonderful experience, you know, by reading your <laughs> profile. I think, yeah. the, I think the beautiful thing is that when you refer to all the other companies that I've worked for and the experiences that I've had, it takes you it makes you kind of travel back in time. Yeah. And uh, makes you remember all the lovely people that you've met over a period of time. So I think yes. that's the beauty of all of you. Yes, yes. But yes, thank yes, you very much. Yes, uh, Chandana, over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Good afternoon. I am student executive Chandana Reddy and I have Impana Javli with me. Once again, we thank you wholeheartedly for accepting our invitation to be a part of this CK Prahalad lecture series conducted by Department of Management Studies, Dainan Sagar College of Engineering, Bengaluru. Ma'am, my first question to you is, Soon after your graduation, you started working as a management trainee in Tata Motors. Can you share your experience of the work environment and the challenges you faced as a fresher? Okay. So I have lots of interesting stories to tell you of that time. I was one of the first two female management trainees that Tata Motors hired. They used to have graduate engineering trainees before and they, they were women in that. And they used to hire management trainees, but they'd never hired women there before. So me and Mahalakshmi, um, you know, another girl, we were the first ever female management trainees that they hired. And it was interesting. Uh, I was also a non-engineer. First, I, I think probably one of the first non-engineer management trainees that they hired. They were la launching cars and they, they appreciated the fact that we would bring in diverse thinking, uh, you know, onto the table. I literally learned everything. I think the world then was a little softer. I think organizations allowed you to learn by making mistakes. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I think I kind of, uh, uh, you know, learned over there how to be in a workplace. I had never worked before. I uh, completed my graduation in Rajasthan and I came to Bombay to study. And then I started, uh, you know, working for Tata Motors after two years of my MBA. So, uh, you know, I, I still remember those were the pre-technology days. Um, you know, you, everybody did not have access to email. Uh, and, uh, 
you know, you, you still left office and you left office in the evening and nobody could contact you till you reached home because you only had the landlines. There were no mobile phones. Uh, it sounds like an alien era to me now. It will sound like an alien era to you guys also. Okay. I think the second thing I want to say is that the college education does not prepare you necessarily for saying you studied this chapter in college, you solve this case study and you come to workplace and you apply it. It doesn't do that. I think what a college education does for you is it trains your mind in risk taking, in critical thinking, in your ability to ask questions. And I think uh, that is what my college education prepared me for. Yes, it prepared me for some of the concepts that I could apply directly. It uh, familiarized me with vocabulary, it familiarized me with how functions are there, you know, inside an organization, basic concepts of, you know, uh, uh, finance and marketing and sales and operations and technology. But remember that all those concepts are outdated today. So what holds me uh, in great strength is the training of the mind that has happened, uh, you know, at college. And I think that's what I would want, uh, you know, everybody to look at and think and focus. But I have I have one more example to give you, which will make all of you laugh. Uh, you know, my, my maiden uh, name was Dipali Garg. Okay. And uh, those were the days when you used to have fax machines. I don't know how many of you. Tell me on, I, I know chat is disabled. Sorry, right? Otherwise, I was going to ask. Put it on the chat window, how many of you even know what fax is all about, okay? So in a fax machine, you basically wrote something, the paper went and it got printed on the oh. other night, right? And uh, so, you know, the, uh, the admin team from Bombay would write to places and I would travel as part of my sales assignment to Kolhapur or to Indore, you know, where we would have our dealers, the Tata Motors dealers, you know, used to be there. Tata Motors did not have... Uh, you know, offices, there were smaller locations where you could go where only the dealers were there, right? And the dealers' offices would pick it up. And, you know, just just think in small letters how you write Dipali. The L-I can actually be like a K, okay? So invariably, I would land at the airport over there and there'll be a patti saying, Mr. Deepak Garg from Tata Motors. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but that didn't happen once, that happened a couple of times, you know? I think I'm narrating this story to tell you, especially both for men and for women, that, you know, it was alien uh, for, uh, you know, women executives to travel, to work and for so on and so forth. It was a different era. You know, I laughingly say this, that today we talk about diversity and inclusion and diversity initiatives. This word did not exist in management voca vocabulary, you know, when we were studying or when I started working. So I'm old uh, and I use L'Oreal. You know, so uh, that's, the, so, so that, that should tell you my age. Okay, Chandana, I hope uh, I have answered your question and I hope this is the kind of stuff you wanted to hear. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, as you mentioned, uh, you graduated in 1993 and you have experience around 26 to 27 years, right? So how do you think the marketing has evolved over this period? Impana. Yes, ma'am. My God, this will take two hours. This question is not simple to answer. Okay, but uh, marketing has evolved completely. Okay. Uh, I think I want to give you three examples and that will not cover everything. Okay? okay, that has changed. But I want to give you three examples, right? One is the advent of e-commerce. Okay. That didn't exist, right? So that's completely changed the game. I myself have led e-commerce business where I was a sales head and I had a sales responsibility, p and responsibility responsibility actually right so that has changed the dimensions of how you do marketing okay so that's one part number one in terms of which is the sales orientation the second thing that internet social media uh, digital conversations digital marketing whatever you want to call it right they're all subsumed in each other did not exist in its full force in india till about 2004 2005 okay we did not have all these channels available in every marketer who has passed out before 2000 have has had to learn them on the job. We were not taught all this in college, right? So that is another evolution. And the second leg that has happened, uh, you know, in marketing. The third thing with the advent of all this, what is called performance marketing today. So in the good old days, you know, you would have the brand, and the communication aspect, right? The correlation of the money that you're spending on the brand to the sales was a fuzzy logic as I call it, okay? Mm -hmm. But today with the performance marketing culture coming in, with digital marketing coming in, where marketing is assisting sales in generating leads, in generating sales, 
you know, uh, there is greater ROI and greater delivery from marketing on, you know, how they're adding value to the users. This also means that marketers need to learn numbers. A lot of the times when we were younger, marketers used to think that if you have a good command over language and if you're very creative, and of course you've done your MBA, that's more than enough. That's not true any longer. Marketers truly require both left brain and right brain thinking today. To me, that is the most beautiful evolution of marketing that has happened, that marketing has a seat on the table today because marketing is able to prove its worth and value in numbers to the business. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, you were one of those CMOs who practiced digital marketing in early years. That's right. What made you take the decision even when it had limited reach to customers? I got lucky. Compared, yeah, compared to print media and the TV, social media had a very limited uh, customer reach, I would say. That's right. I think I, I did get lucky. So, um, uh, you know, in 2004, November, uh, uh, I gave birth to my son. Uh, and I took a break in 2005. Uh, you know, after my maternity leave and whatever. So I was away for about a year, uh, you know, from active work. I used to work for Marico, so I quit Marico and I was at home. But when I was at home, and I'm a very strong proponent that you should not take a holiday, uh, you know, when you take a break, I was doing a lot of work for an American organization. Uh, they were in the area of marketing processes consultants, uh, uh, consulting. And I was doing work for uh, Microsoft uh, as, because Microsoft was their client and I was doing work for them. And I was doing work for Kimberly Clark. Uh, and uh, I was doing a lot, I was writing about a lot of marketing processes, which meant that I needed to research uh, a lot on what was the marketing situation in US, okay? Uh, because it was Microsoft and a technology company, which was one of the clients that they were doing work for at that point of time, I, I used to read up a lot of what was the state of marketing in US. And internet had already happened over there, right? So that reading about it made me appreciate that, you know, the, it's only a matter of time before this comes to India and before it becomes as big in India as it is over there, right? And I'm personally, as a person, uh, always like to do new things. You know, I, I get bored very quickly as a person. Uh, so it interested me. Uh, so when I, after my uh, break, when I went back this time, I joined as a uh, uh, you know, head of marketing and products at HSBC Asset Management. So when I joined over there, I was very conscious that I put up my hand for all the technology projects. It wasn't exactly uh, shaped the way it is now, uh, but I didn't shy away from putting up my hands for implementation even of a CRM project. You know, we used to have a pro uh, we used to have a CRM called Talisma. Uh, you know, so from the marketing side, if you had to learn something about it or champion it, I don't even remember the exact details of that project, by the way. Sorry, but you know, I remember this that in in, in my head somewhere I said that listen, I'm going to put up my hand and um, uh, learn about or participate in technology oriented projects, you know, whichever way it is. Uh, so the, I've explained to you the reason behind it and I've also explained to you how I did it. Ma'am, uh, you are not only updated, but you have worked in various industries. Like you have been a CMO in uh, Mahindra Holidays and even IBM. So how do you think the marketing as a function, it differed between these ind industries and how did you reinvent yourself? Okay. So, you know, Impana, this is a question I get asked everywhere. And the reason for that is that I think I am told, uh, okay, that I'm one of those absolutely unique set of people who've changed, uh, you know, managed to change industries from FMCG to financial services and then to technology. There are not too many people who've done that. Maybe, maybe one or two other people and they're my friends. I know them. Okay. But not too many people have done that. And my answer is actually very simple. You know, okay. that is where you go back to basics. And if you read the Kotler, Cap Ferrer, David Arker, you know, they, they, when they talk about brands and when they talk about marketing, they've got only one model, right? They don't evolve a different model for a tech brand versus a financial services brand versus an FMCT brand, right? When you study brand identity, when you study brand management, when you study channel management, when you study... Uh, you know, promotions, the four P's of marketing or the BCG matrix, you know, anything that you study, that model applies across industries. Okay. Now, if you are a genuine marketer and if you understand this well, 
then that basic principle of understanding customer, doing customer segmentation, understanding customer journey, knowing where all marketing can play a role to influence that customer towards your brand, that journey you've got to put it down. So I, the only secret sauce to this that I can share with you is that I always start with the customer or the consumer. If you can solve a customer or a consumer problem, if as a marketer you understand what's happening to them, and the role that your brand has to play, you will get it right. Now, you know, whether you do an ad in a general entertainment channel or whether you do a visiting card of a sales guy or whether you do this sales brochure, which will help, or whether you do a poster at a retail store, I think to me is all about mechanics. It's all about knowing what message needs to be done. Now, I have said this and I repeat this very often. A few days back, I was at MICA and then, you know, they also asked me the same question and I give the same answer. But I had, I had like a pushback from the students. They said, ma'am, you make it sound so simple. It isn't like this. Okay. Exactly. Right. So I know I've got that pushback enough times now. Right. So that's when I say that. Yes. But in my mind, it is. <laughs> okay. In my mind, it is that simple. But I do think therefore that I think each one of you have got to have a template of your own of understanding what marketing is all about, sales is all about, how a business is run. See, once you become a senior marketer, it's not enough for you to just be able to market a financial product or just be able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, market a, a, a cooking oil. You also need to understand how a company makes money because you become you are also responsible as a senior leader for company's profitability somewhere, right? So you've got to understand how businesses are run, which is the more profitable part of the business, okay? Uh, where do the commissions go? You know, how do you kind of save costs? You've got to manage all that also, right? So there I say, I, by the way, I'm only married to a Nair. I'm a Marwari by birth. So there I say, you know, the numbers are in my blood. So I get it. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Ma'am, as you said earlier, you were one of those few people who changed uh, your career in various industries. Like you have worked with many companies like Tata Motors, BPL, HSBC, Mahindra Holidays, now IBM. As you said, why was it important for you to make those moves into various industries? Okay, it wasn't important at all. <laughs> so, um, okay, why? I think let me give you an example of why some of those changes, uh, uh, you know, happened. Uh, I think most of my jobs, I haven't gone job hunting. Okay. Barring when I took a break with my son, when I had to actually go look for a job because people didn't know whether I wanted to come back to a job at all or not. Barring those times, it's always been somebody who I know, either a past boss or, you know, somebody in the HR team who's moved from here to there. Or, or, or once even my client moved an organization and I used to work for an ad agency and he recommended my name. Most of the times people have come to me and said, hey, would you like to join us, you know? So I haven't gone hunting, you know? So those jobs have got sold to me on account of this is what you will do new or this is something you will enjoy. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the beautiful things about uh, being a woman uh, is that uh, you are the second income, okay? So you can afford to take a risk, okay? Which the chief major owner of the family, the man cannot actually, okay? So when you're able to take a risk, you take all these risks. So my jobs were all risks and I don't recommend them to everybody. Please do not follow the path that I did, okay? It is not a standard path. It is just unnatural and serendipity. I'm only grateful to God that I landed well on my feet every time. Um, Ma'am, talking about digital transformation, uh, what, what are the initiatives uh, regarding the digital tra transformation uh, taken by IBM currently, like uh, IBM working currently on? Okay. Uh, so I have, I will be able to talk in a limited fashion about the work that we're doing at IBM because some of the work that we're doing is, of course, confidential. But there are two things that people need to keep in mind. Okay. One is that IBM as a business, as a technology partner, uh, we are enabling very large organizations in their digital transformation process, right? So that is the consulting part of the business. That is a tech stack that we have, you know, whether it is cloud, whether it is security, whether it is AI, whether it is blockchain, we partner the largest enterprises oh. in the world and we support and assist them in their digital transformation. 
So that's one. The number two, I think the concepts that I explained to you earlier, whether it is e-commerce, whether it is performance marketing, whether it is measurement of ROI, whether what you said, you know, social media and internet, right? All those are methodologies and channels that we follow in marketing, uh, you know, at IBM. Uh, and uh, my global CMO, Michelle Peluso, she talks about, uh, you know, uh, agile methodology and agility, which means your ability to pivot fast, your ability to change fast, you know. I think that is at the heart of all of this. Uh, if our customer is changing fast, then we need to change fast in the way we market to them, knowing, you know, who they are. And I think that's one of the reasons that when, uh, when this whole current situation of COVID happened, uh, IBM's marketing teams across the world and in India were able to pivot very quickly in terms of changing and transforming ourselves. Uh, one other thing that I want to say is that digital transformation is a journey uh, because uh, more and more consumers and businesses get digital. Uh, uh, companies such as IBM's marketing and IBM will also need to focus on that aspect. Uh, and therefore, there is there's no end to it, and technologies will keep on changing. And you know, given the focus that we have at IBM on research and on patents and on investing, uh, you know, into new technologies, I think IBM uh, for you know hundreds of years will probably stay at the forefront of ensuring that uh, we are able to service the needs of the end customer by enabling uh, very large organizations, uh, you know, who service the end customer. Thank you, Vanam. Yeah. Speaking of uh, technology and analytics, please share with us the role the analytics plays in marketing function. Okay, I think uh, I think Chandana, I kind of answered that question earlier. Remember when I said that the marketing has to look at numbers and stuff like that, right? Uh, I think analytics is a very micro aspect of that whole thing, but analytics enables that we are looking at numbers, whether it comes to content, whether it comes to sales profitability, whether it comes to the ROI culture, analyt analytics plays a role. So you never had analytics in marketing, uh, you know, um, I think before 2006, uh, that's when I earliest remember teams having analytics. But today, you have full-fledged analytics teams uh, inside very large organizations, such as maybe a telecom company, which is a function by itself. Or, you know, within marketing, again, you have the analytics teams who are doing, uh, looking at your digital marketing concepts and the money that you're spending, the sales that you're getting, uh, the customer data that you have. Uh, and enabling marketing teams and also sales teams in uh, taking better decisions of reaching the customer, how to reach them, developing communication, and the media vehicle choices that you make. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, moving on to uh, geographical part, like you had opportunity to uh, work in uh, Asia-Pacific uh, parts of the companies like uh, Samsung and all. So how the marketing activities differ from India and other Asia Pacific countries? So let me clarify. I think okay. whatever roles that I've managed, whether they are APAC or a South Asia, uh, I've all managed them from India. Okay, so I've not physically lived there. Uh, the Samsung project was a project that I managed when I was at FCB Ulka. And I'm, uh, I'm so glad you guys researched that out. I'm surprised, okay? Uh, but compliments to you guys. So uh, Samsung was an FCB Ulka client and I used to head planning for the group where we were doing the Samsung project and there was a project that we managed for them across uh, Asia Pacific, uh, which meant that I got an opportunity to study consumers across Australia, across Singapore, across Malaysia and across India and, you know, uh, compare how they were doing. Um, and I think it's only the consumer centric thing that I want to talk about. Consumers are different across the world. How they buy things are different. Why they buy things are different. Um, and that is the reason why marketing teams exist in various parts of the countries. Otherwise, you would have one marketing team sitting in the global headquarters only. Um, uh, you know, one or two of the things that I that I sincere that I remember, which was you know, which was a surprise to a young mind who was doing, uh, you know, that kind of work at that point of time. I remember when. Um, you know, in India, for example, we used to have this technique to get the consumers to talk about uh, a brand and the brand personality uh, during market research. You know, we would very easily tell the consumer over here, okay, if this brand were a person and if this person were to die and this brand were to disappear, how would you feel? Or what would you write on the, you know, uh, uh, grave, uh, gravestone or whatever, right? And... Uh, 
we used to use this technique and I remember, you know, uh, using this technique, wanting to use this technique when I was in Singapore to do the research among us, the consumers. And my team in Singapore said, no, Dipali, you cannot do this. And I was like, you know, where is this whole intensity of no coming from? And they said, you know, talking about death to a certain set of community is taboo. You cannot okay. talk about death to them, right? So there are cultural nuances. Then the other thing that I still remember is that refrigerators in India, you know, Samsung, of course, uh, used to be very big in all the brown goods at home and the white goods at home, right? Refrigerators in India were still not uh, in the in the higher SEC, especially the bigger refrigerators. They're relegated to the kitchen. And, uh, you know, they're not in the hall, uh, you know, in tier one towns and, you know, top end of the market where Samsung used to play. But in Singapore, they, it's mostly open kitchens, right? So in India, the consumer would look at functionality and pricing and size inside the, the you know, refrigerator. In Singapore, they hardly cooked at home and they hardly stored. It was minimally used. So the look of the refrigerator was the first thing that you know, they would look at to buy, right? So uh, just wanted to narrate uh, uh, the differences between different countries uh, through this manner. In Australia, for example, they were again very functional. But they all wanted deep freezers because of the whole amount of non-veg cooking that they have and the fact that they store uh, food quite a lot, right? So they, there was a market for deep freezers which doesn't even exist, you know, as much uh, in India. So mm -hmm. each market has its own nuance. These are, you know, 20 years back and I, these are the ones that I remember, the anecdotes from that time. Oh, thank you, ma'am. So speak, speaking of branding, what is your approach in branding a company? its products and its services? That's a very wide question. That requires a, uh, that requires a full course. Hema ji, can I not answer this one? I mean, this is genuinely, this is genuinely like your full brand management course that you're asking me to answer in one question. Ma'am, maybe the key points. Uh, I think there's no one approach, first of all. Okay. Uh, for example, for every standalone brand, we have a family of brands also, right, uh, which, which stands there. Uh, so for example, you have Unilever as a successful company and they uh, don't have Unilever branding. They have individual brands, right? So they, yeah. have, uh, they have the Lux and they have Surf and uh, Kisan and uh, which are the other brands? Lifebuoy. Uh, and uh, and uh, Pons and Lacme, uh, no, no longer Lacme. Okay, so these are the, so they have the brands, right? And then simultaneously, you will have an example from a Japan, or you you know you will have some Indian brands. Uh, you know, for example, Tata's, and they have the Tata Motors and the Tata Chemicals, and uh, you know the Tata Car, and then you know everything Tata. Uh, uh, which is uh, branded. So uh, to me, therefore, there's no one simple formula. I think one needs to look at, um, uh, you know, the, the market that you want to play at. One needs to look at what competitive brands exist, uh, who are you going to compete with, and then look at your branding strategy. I have been lucky uh, that at uh, HSBC Asset Management, I launched a new brand of portfolio management services. I've been lucky at LNT. I did an extension of the LNT corporate brand into LNT financial services and LNT insurance. Uh, you know, even when I was in advertising, uh, we, run, we launched. Uh, we we were the advertising agency. The brand was another company. It's the Act Two popcorn. So that was a new brand that I worked on. Uh, you know, we uh, we used to manage a brand called uh, Sundrop uh, Cooking Oil. And uh, we wanted to launch an Atta. And I still remember a huge debate about whether it should be called Sundrop Atta or not. Uh, for whatever it is worth, we launched Healthy World Data and we did not launch a Sandra Pata. But then I'm the same person who managed Sapola and Sapola has, you know, very good extensions. Some of them are even now, which I didn't even work on. Uh, I used to look after medical shampoo and we launched a medical hair oil, uh, you know, which we did an extension of. So I've been lucky to work on a lot of branding work. Um, do extensions, do new launches, do new brand launches. And my experience tells me that each one is unique. There is no formula for it. Okay. That's the message that I want to leave you guys with. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, you have worked, on, uh, worked as a project consultant for publishing papers on how to market to women or uh, how to market to children. Can you please elaborate on the importance of marketing to women and children? Okay, I think, you know, remember I said that I took a break when my son was born and I was yes. to work for Microsoft and Kimberly Clark. So yes, work on women and children was actually that work that they were doing some work for Kimberly Clark okay, in the US. Okay. 
I think it's a very unique, uh, uh, unique uh, buying unit, uh, the mother and the children bit, uh, which is that uh, 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 when it comes to children, the buyer is the mother and the consumer is the child. Right, so it's in a it's in a very unique space. So, for example, when you look at products such as Bon Vita, or when you look at products such as chocolates, or when you look at products such as ice cream, right? Uh, why does a mother buy an ice cream despite thinking it's not good for my child, right? And child has a role to play, and mother has a role to play, and you know which brand and how, and therefore there is that uh, there is that equation that happens. So it is not as simple as selling a mobile phone to an individual. It is uh, you know not as simple as uh, uh, you know that that consumer equation uh, you know is very different, and you have to uh, play a different role. So it is not as simple as selling a cooking oil to a housewife because. She's the one who will play a role over there, right? It is not as simple as selling a face wash brand to you young girls because you will make that decision and it will not be a family decision, right? And there are not too strong people who are kind of participating in that decision. So when you have, when you are working on a product such as, you know, bone meter, especially for example, where the kids will look at taste and the mom will look at health, uh, there are two sets of people that you've got to satisfy, whether it is your product, taste the actual product, or whether it is packaging, or whether it is, you know, the communication. Uh, uh, there are uh, different audiences there. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, you were awarded Content Marketeer of Year, Content Marketeer of the Year by DMAI in 2015. What is your take on good content? Good content is the only thing that matters, uh, is what I would say. Uh, but everything is content, okay? From your 30-second ad that appears on television to every word written on your website, to every word and tweet and social media post that you put out from your brand, to every word that your customer is putting out about you in their social media handles is also content for you. Uh, to a newspaper article written about you, to what the journalist says about you. Uh, what have I left out actually, guys? Uh, to the brochure that you might have. I think everything is content. So first is that basic principle, okay? That, that everything is content. Uh, and then is that how do you drive a narrative across content pieces? It can't be the same line and the same message. It has to complement each other. And the work that I did at Mahindra Holidays and at l and Insurance got me that award because, uh, uh, you know, uh, in that era when digital marketing was understood a little less, a lot of the brand managers were actually just copying uh, you know, the creative, both uh, the visual and the copy part of it and just translating and just changing and adapting it to various medium. They weren't rethinking what the medium needed. And, you know, why should your Facebook post read very different from an Insta post, needs to read different from a tweet. And on LinkedIn, your company needs to completely talk about different things and not about that same thing, right? Uh, you girls now, into, uh, and I'm saying girls, and I'm sure there are uh, you know boys also you know, who have logged in. It's just that I can see I'm Impana and Chandra on my screen and therefore I'm referring to them. So pardon me for that. So you kids, let me call it, okay? You kids understand this intrinsically, right? You know that you can't do the same things that you do on Instagram, that you do on Twitter, right? Now, yeah. that appreciation, when you come on the marketing side to say what my emailer needs to say, what my telecalling script needs to say, what my ad needs to say, and how often do I need to be out there on Facebook? You will do an ad once in six months or a year, but you need everyday fresh material if you're putting it out on Facebook, right? That appreciation, you know, is uh, all about content. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I still remember the citation that somebody read out for me saying that, you know, everybody knows that you need to get content right, uh, but uh, Deepali gets it right. Kudos <laughs> to you for getting it right. I, I, I think so. I think so. I'm, uh, I, I spend a lot of time on my brands. Uh, one of my, uh, you know, one of my favorite bosses, Nitin Bhagwat, that... Uh, uh, you know, FCB Ulka, uh, he used to say something very beautiful, uh, which is to say, he says, you know, you've got to know your brand and product so well uh, that there should be nothing about that brand and the product category that you don't know. Okay. He used to, I, I don't remember what is the term he used to use, but I, I call it 101 on your product and brand. Like, you know, you have those uh, uh, dummy idiot guides about baking and so on and so forth. So uh, I think a head of marketing or a brand manager needs to be like that dummy idiot guide on your product and the brand. You should be able to answer any random question about your category and about your brand. 
uh, so I think if you kind of do that, and that's the approach I've always come from, if you do that, I think you will get your content right. Um, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, having experience in launching new products uh, like Safola or Medicare, can you please share some of the steps on uh, leading customer towards purchasing the new product or uh, even the necessary step for post-launch of the new product? Okay, so this question is not fair because I didn't launch Safola. Safola I mean, is the I marketing did. part. Yeah. So, and yeah. I, I, I just mentioned that I launched the medical hair oil and not, uh, you know, the shampoo. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of steps, I think uh, first is the rigor on the numbers. Okay, you've got to be very sure what your business plan looks like, what investments you're going to make. Uh, when you're launching something like a medic medical hair oil, which offers the same benefit as a medical shampoo, there is certain amount of cannibalization that's going to happen of the medical shampoo. You need to work out those numbers. So I think first is a plan on a paper. And you've got to convince your board or your bosses or the managing director that you know this is what the plan looks like and why should a business invest into this new launch? Because it's an investment. It can go wrong, right? So I think uh, uh, the consumer work, the market research, uh, the working on the numbers all needs to play out uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know what will work. Once that happens and you get a sanction, then I think uh, uh, you've got to, if, if there is a way of test marketing it, then it's a great thing. If you can't, then you just got to launch it. Uh, you've got to work with in the manufacturing space. It's easier in the financial services domain because you don't have this whole manufacturing and QC level and you know all of those things. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so so that's where, that's where you you begin. And if it's a brand extension, then uh, the brand core is already there, so you don't do a new brand core. Uh, but uh, you of course look at new packaging and new. Uh, since you asked me about FMCG, so I'm giving that example. You look at packaging, you look at communication, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, so all elements of marketing come into play. Okay, thank you, Ma. Well, speaking of team management, it is the most important trait. And how have you managed teams in your ex in your various organizations? I use just two principles now. Okay. One is I've got to be friends with them, which means that I should love spending time with them. Okay. My principle is that I perhaps spend more time with my team than I do with my family. If you actually start calculating waking up hours and you, you leave out your sleeping hours, right? I think the most time that I spend is with my team. So I've got to like them. I've got to be friends with them. So that's a one principle I operate. With. The second principle that I operate with is that my immediate team, you know, people who report to me. So I will have a large team. Let's say I have a 50 member team at IBM, right? But the people who report into me directly are about six or seven. Uh, that's a kind of span of control you will have uh, invariably, you know, three to 11 kind of a span of control. So six to seven people. I don't know, maybe I have nine or 10. I'm not sad. Uh, my principle has always been that I will hire the kind of people who are that good at their work that I don't mind reporting to them right now. Okay. Okay. So if you hire a team who's, who you're friends with, so these are the intelligent people that you're friends with and they're intelligent and great leaders in themselves, right? Uh, I think team management after that is very easy. These are the two principles I use. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you have conducted various digital marketing campaigns starting from FMCG market to travel and holiday to corporate products which was the easiest and toughest campaign and what are the various challenges you faced in these platforms? I, oh, oh gosh, which is the easiest. Nothing is easy. Everything is tough. Okay. I think everything is tough because everything carries a risk with it. Okay. Uh, I think it was easy when I was younger. Okay. Because I did not carry the can, right? My boss carried the can. I was not the head of market. Right, I was not, I was not the CEO. You know. uh, but as you've grown older, the moment you've got the head of marketing mantle, the moment uh, the risk is yours, the the moment, as I say, your neck is on the block. As a marketing head of marketing, my neck is on the block. Right, every every decision that you take at work every day, you've got to measure the risk attached to it, and you take uh, you take decisions. Uh, you want to get them right. Uh, you don't get all of them right. Okay. I think you learn from your failures also. So nothing is easiest uh, in that sense. 
Um, but uh, I still think that if there is, if you create an environment where there is room for you to experiment, where you know that this is a pilot I'm running or this is an experiment I'm running, the risk is a little less. So running the pilots is easy. But then the joy of getting a pilot right is also great. Okay. So the easy and tough go hand in hand in that sense, right? If you get it very easy, then the joy of uh, getting it right is also going to be smaller. Okay. Uh, that's my thought on it. And I know that I haven't answered your question directly, but you know, this is what I wanted to say. <laughs> no, ma'am, it's just an opinion. Thank you. Ma'am, speaking of pilot projects, when a campaign or a strategy in marketing doesn't work as expected, say customer doesn't have a positive response or a feedback. Now, how do you address and solve that situation? You're asking me about a campaign, right? Yeah, campaign or a strategy. You pull off the campaign and do a new one. Simple. Okay. They, there are some if adverse the effects. not getting it, if the customer's not getting your message, then you've made a mistake. You better cut your losses now. So act fast. Yeah, very fast. Okay. Don't think too much about it. Okay, I'm also conscious of the time. It is 2.14, Hemaji. And, uh, uh, you know, you may want to wind up. Uh, 2.25 is when I want to close. Sorry, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, no, problem. no, we have enough time to ask as many questions, but we've got only 10 minutes. Yes. Uh, ma'am, what are the trending and essential three top marketing metrics that you actually recommend? Sorry, I didn't even, I couldn't hear your question well, Impana. Uh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, what are the trending and essential three top marketing metrics that actually you recommend? That's a wrong question because I think the matrix will differ in different categories and industries. So I don't think there is any top three matrix. But yes, as a philosophy, I already shared with you guys that I think marketing uh, people should think about how they're adding value to the business and can they prove the contribution to the sales level. Yes, sorry. No need to say sorry. Come on, it's all right. Thank you. Ma'am, what do you consider the biggest challenge for a CMO these days? How do you work with your executive team to get most out of the marketing situation, marketing function? I think that I answered become friends with team. them and hire a brilliant team uh, and uh, look at how marketing is delivering value to uh, the sales team. What was the first part of your question? What do you consider the biggest challenge? This is the biggest challenge. Proving that marketing is uh, adding value to sales or adding value to the business or adding profitability or cutting costs. Okay. Ma'am, amid this corona situation or any uncertain situations, according to you, what would be the limitation or difficulties faced in traditional marketing? I think the challenge would be more on the product side. Imagine you can still do advertising, but your product is not even available at the stores. People are not getting out. I think uh, challenges will again be different for different categories, uh, but there will be some products uh, which are not going to get sold just now. So for example, uh, shoes. You're not going to have people walking into the shoe stores to buy shoes or um, scarves or hats or handbags or non-essential items as I call it. Uh, but the skincare might still sell, maybe not as much. Uh, surprisingly, uh, you know, eye makeup is doing very well, I'm told, uh, you know, despite it not being an essential. So I think the challenge is less on the marketing side, but more on the demand side from the con uh, customer. And the fact that uh, you have a supply chain uh, that may not even make the product available on the stores will be an issue. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, how to sell ourselves? to a company when we do not have a specific work experience, but we have gained the necessary skills like AI or machine learning, digital marketing tactics, etc. Believe that you don't have any skills. That's when you'll be able to sell yourself to any company. The fact that you think you know too much is an issue, I think. <laughs> okay, be a learner, have a learning approach. Approach the organizations by saying, we are here to learn. I bring a good mind, but I'm willing to learn. Okay. Ma'am, uh, you were a mentor for many startups, which were led by women entrepreneurs. So what is your suggestion to young people or anyone who is starting a company? 
I think, um, again, I would say, go back and look at the customer. The product or the value proposition that you're driving in the market, how large is really the need for that product? Value proposition. To me, it all comes back to that. Start with the, start with the consumer. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, moving on to... Uh, what do you consider uh, like uh, for MBA student to create or nurture their digital brand to uh, attract the prospective employees? Same answer. So you asked me that question, right? How to sell ourselves to prospective uh, employers, right? Your digital brand should also be about a person who is a lifelong learner. I mean the digital presence. Yeah, digital presence, whether you're on LinkedIn or on Twitter should be the approach should be that you're a lifelong learner. Oh, come on. Thank you. I know that, that I know that I've not given you a recipe to say put three tweets out every day, write one LinkedIn post and you know, comment on ten people and follow ten people. That's not the approach, really that isn't. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So ma'am, according, according to you the key skills for any marketeer would be understand better understanding of a consumer and keep learning yes and and understanding how analytics works and to get more lead generation and roi is it how do you sum it up so chandra you've summed it up very well my compliments to you by the way okay uh, start with the consumer end with the consumer observe the trends that are happening in the market be willing to take the risk to put up your hand when something new is happening and don't think that it's not mainstream. It might become mainstream very, very quickly. Don't shy away from the numbers. You need to use both your left brain and your right brain for getting marketing right these days. And hire great people in your team. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, how do you work with your executive team? Like uh, you told the six members will uh, approach you. If they are going something wrong beyond those people, so how do you take on that? I think, uh, sorry, Impanna, that's not even a fair or a detailed enough question for me to react to. <laughs> no, I, I mean the challenges you face as a CMO because you would be answerable for many people. Yeah, so I've answered that. If you make a mistake, be humble enough and cut your losses very quickly and change it. Don't live with that mistake. And nobody is perfect. I'm not perfect either. No organization is perfect. Mistakes happen. I think most organizations allow for small mistakes and learning opportunities for their employees. Every organization that I work for has allowed for that level of, uh, you know, mistake to happen. But I think I, also I will admit, not just for myself, but every CMO that I know, every marketing person that I know, I think a lot of care goes into making the decisions in the first place. You don't get them wrong because you're careless. You get them wrong sometimes because the market's moved ahead and the customers are not where they were and so on and so forth, right? So they're not mistakes in that sense in my mind. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Hima ji. Sorry, Chandana, you have one last question? Yeah. yeah, last question. I wanted to ask final words or your advice to students and um, I, to all the MBAs, there are various kinds of students uh, in this seminar so not just MBA students engineering students maybe so um, your final words of advice to all of us especially uh, the graduating batch of 2020 so the only thing I want to say is that don't worry you will do well I know that when you pass out in a year such as this it is looks very tough I passed out in a year when um, there were bomb blasts in Bombay just before that. So it was a tough year. It was a recessionary phase that we passed out. We did okay. Um, I think that's one advice. Second is don't measure your life in terms of what's going to happen in the next two, three years or four, five years. Measure your life in the context of the next 30 years. And then one year out of 30 may not seem that tough to you. Third is uh, be a lifelong learner. And for that, uh, read, read, read a lot. Uh, read everything that you can lay your hands on. And uh, now, of course, add on your learning through a lot of the good stuff that's available on uh, you know, YouTube. Every moment that you spend on Netflix, instead, uh, spend, on some, spend, spend on listening to something which is motivational or educational. This is the era when you uh, uh, need to learn, uh, uh, perhaps. So learning, I think, 
Fourth is uh, develop the ability to ask the right questions so that you get different answers. Um, fifth is develop humility. Don't think that you know everything. Lots of people know different things. Lots of people are different in the perspectives that they bring to the table. Have the humility, uh, you know, to appreciate uh, uh, that. And the last one, and very important, as human beings, learn to be grateful. You know, be grateful. Uh, I think today I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that my family is healthy. Uh, today I'm grateful for the fact that my work family is healthy, that everybody that I know at work is healthy. Uh, I think uh, I'm grateful for the fact that they're all alive, you know, that it was only COVID and that it was not some other great, uh, you know, misery that uh, came on to uh, Mother Earth. Uh, so I think that that last one of being grateful will actually take you to a lot of good places. Wonderful, wonderful, Deepali. Nice, it's nice talking to you. I think I'm so proud that I have given, brought you here and given the opportunity for my students to interact. And one final compliment from my side, you are smiling so contagious and I'm smiling throughout my sessions that uh, so lively and wonderful interaction. Thank you very much, Amit, of your busy schedule. You have given us uh, time and uh, for our students. Thank you very much, Deepali. And we got a good opportunity to interact with you. I have been watching you and following you. In 2015, I got the opportunity to bring him here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Himaji. And I think your students need to thank you for how relentlessly, with perseverance, you pursued me. You didn't. <laughs> because a lot of other colleges reach out to me and you know amidst me saying oh i don't want to do this and can you only do this on saturday and what are you really going to ask me himaji did not give up so i think all of you students need to if you like my session by the way i think you should thank her for that because she made it possible very well managed uh, uh, you know by chandana and impana very, very good job done, girls. Uh, I am so impressed and wish you well, uh, you know, in life. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I have one request to the students. There are some 200 of them, you know, over here. If you are on Instagram, please follow me. It is Dipali yeah. Nair, D-E-P-A-L-I-N-A-A-I-R. I've got to prove it to the Gen Zs in my team that I can I can cut it on Instagram also. Yeah. Uh, I have a huge following on LinkedIn, uh, about 14,000 people. Please follow me on LinkedIn also. And I don't know how many of you are on Twitter. Please follow me on Twitter too. I have yeah, I, very nice Twitter. I have seen yeah, every yeah. day. Yeah, so I'm very active. So active, so active. So active. Have fun. And you can ask me all the questions that you yeah, want yeah, to ask yeah. on Twitter. Yeah, I answer. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering that how much time you have to tweet. I know, like I have been watching everything. Wonderful. I have a sense of humor yeah. on Twitter. Yeah, and yeah. Great fun. Very so lively. Once again, my handle yeah. is D double E P A L I N double A I R. I hope I I I already hope shared with them. Follow us today on Instagram. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. You will get it, ma'am, sure. Yeah. So please <laughs> post it on the chat and send my handle to everyone. Yeah, Just yeah. Now okay. you're responsible. Sure, ma'am, sure, sure. <laughs> thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. I thank really you. enjoyed answering yes, all the yes. questions. A uh, bit of nostalgia. Uh, you made me remember my old bosses. You made me remember my old uh, brands and the work that I did in the case studies. Uh, I truly appreciate it. I will not forget your smiling face at all with the lively interactions, Deepali. <laughs> Wonderful. But, you know, one needs yeah. to smile. Nice. I, you know, like, yeah, uh, you've got to in the... <laughs> like that. You know, if, if, you know, if you think, you know, uh, so I don't know how many of you understand Hindi, but if you think that, you know, life is a boch, you know, yeah. it's difficult, it will be difficult. Okay. Yeah. And it's not like I haven't seen difficult times in my life. I have plenty of difficult times. Okay, and very very tough life at that okay i will admit that myself but i think you've got to pass through life's fine yeah and yeah. develop a sense of humor and that is the learning for us yeah yeah the last one you asked me the past the last message which i said of gratefulness okay equally important is the ability to laugh at yourself yeah <laughs> yes you must had a nice nice yeah. interaction with you very nice human being thank today you. Yeah, wonderful because thank you bye bye guys bye bye yeah, my love to all of you thank yeah, you thank you ma'am thank you bye bye thank you thank you